My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. Number one is uh, you can go and write a review on iTunes, which will help me a lot. And uh, number two is you can simply come to singularityweblog.com and just make a donation. As always, I will be the man with the questions, and today my guest with the answers will be one of my favorite science fiction authors, Robert J. Sawyer. Robert J. Sawyer um, already was a guest on my show about five years ago, and many people to this day keep sending me emails saying that it's one of my best ever. Unfortunately, however, at the time we only had the chance to do the interview via Skype and we had a very poor video connection. So I vowed to myself on that day that the very next time I get to interview Robert, I would make sure I give him the quality that him, his persona and his work deserve. And so today we're actually visiting Robert in his penthouse apartment in uh, Toronto and uh, it's it's quite a place to be in i have to say so let me just open up with thanks very much for having us in your house Robert. my pleasure delighted to have you here welcome fantastic so how have you been doing what's what's new with uh, robert j sawyer uh, since our last interview well it has been five years the singularity should have come and gone by this point <laughs> actually if both of us have been writing our predictions five years ago but what's new for me is my new book quantum night and uh, normally in five years i would have had five new books because i've been a book a year guy for 22 years and actually Speaking of singularity and how fast we're making pros progress, I got derailed because my younger brother got diagnosed with and ultimately died from lung cancer. One of those things that futurists like me have been saying uh, and medical doctors have been saying forever, it's going to be cured within 20 years. So we've been saying that for a uh, hundred years now. Uh, I'm actually a little bit less positive about the rate of technological progress because Good people are still dying from diseases that clearly we should have been able to solve by now. But it took me three years to get that book done instead of my usual one because of that. Yeah, and for a very legitimate reason. But uh, And so uh, today, by the way, uh, our topic is of course going to cover your uh, latest book, Quantum Night, mm -hmm. which I just finished uh, listening to on uh, 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 as an audiobook, and I enjoy it greatly. But I do also want to touch on, on some of those topics, such as uh, life extension, mm -hmm. transhumanism, the singularity, and artificial intelligence. But let's do that uh, step by step. So first of all, tell us, what is Quantum Night all about? You know, it's funny because the title doesn't give very much away at all. It's got that word quantum in it, but my preferred title for the book was The Philosopher's Zombie. And the book starts with an epigram from David Chalmers, an Australian philosopher of mind, who is the man or the person best associated with that thought experiment. The thought experiment is straightforward. Uh, you drove here today. It was a new place for you to come, and you were probably very attentive to it. But if you went to work on a routine basis, the same place, you might find that you've driven to work and have no recollection of having done so. You might read a page in a book, not my book, you understand, but <laughs> somebody else's book, get to the bottom of the page and not have any consciousness of what it was that you read and yet your eyes clearly tracked. And we can even do priming experiments where I say to you, okay, name an animal, I don't know, what, uh, aardvark. Aardvark was on the page that you supposedly didn't read. So there is something going on that isn't conscious. There's driving a, a multi-ton vehicle, negotiating in and out, that can be done without consciousness. You can have a phone call in the middle of the night and agree to uh, work overtime on a holiday weekend and have no recollection that you made that crazy agreement because you could even have, you could pass the Turing test, have a conversation over a phone line, the person on the other end having no way of determining that you weren't conscious when you did it. So Chalmers said, uh, it's logically coherent. There's no internal contradictions to say if people can sometimes do high level behaviors with no consciousness, maybe some people do them all the time with no actual inner life. And I wanted to call it the philosopher zombie uh, because that's the name of the experiment. And uh, the marketing department at my publisher, Ace Science Fiction in New York, 
Penguin uh, Canada in Toronto said that will confuse the marketplace. And they're right. The book is about brains, not brains. So we had to lose the Z word or the Z word, zombie. Uh, but quantum is a good word to have in the title too. You know from our past conversations, I'm a big fan of Stuart Hameroff and uh, Roger Penrose and their um, uh, orc, orc or or r. It's hard to even say orc yes. or r o r. I can't even say it. That may be why the theory is not as popular as it should be. It needs a good name like the philosopher's zombie, right? It needs a, a sexy name. Orc o r uh, um, orchestrated objective reductionism or whatever it is. Um, and uh, I'm a big fan of their work. And the quantum physics of that is what the quantum refers to in the title. It's a novel where experimental psychology in the sort of Stanley Milgram, uh, uh, Philip Zimbardo, Wild West days of experimental psychology in a flashback uh, s uh, plot line crashes up with modern cutting edge quantum physics of consciousness. That's what the book's about. Yes, and, and you opened up so many topics that, I, and I want to grab all of them, but <laughs> let's let's start uh, step by step. Uh, still, um, do you have a clear thesis or kind of an argument or a possibility that you're exploring in this book? And if you do, yes, I'm going to presage that with two things. First, the quote from Chalmers at the front of the book says, "It may be." Uh, a fact that any theory of consciousness must contain at least one crazy idea. Yeah. And I got to say my second thing, which is the purpose of science fiction, I'm a science fiction novelist, is not to put forth the most likely scenario suggested by modern science, but rather the most entertaining one that can't easily be gainsaid by what we know. So that said, yes, I have a thesis. My thesis is this. Uh, Penrose and Hameroff think that consciousness is quantum mechanical in nature, and they've refined their theory um, very much over the years since it sort of first occurred to Penrose when he wrote uh, The Emperor's New Mind that there must be uh, a quantum mechanical component uh, to consciousness, and he has an argument based on Gödel's incompleteness theorem for justifying that. But their model uh, was fundamentally based on the notion that the cellular scaffolding, the stuff that made cells not just go flat like a, like jelly, um, within neurons in every other body cell that has scaffolding, is uh, made up of microtubulin. And each piece of micro, each uh, bit of microtubulin is made up of tubulin dimers. And each dimer has a hydrophobic pocket in it that can have a free electron uh, in it that might be in the top lobe, might be in the bottom lobe, or as they say, or maybe when you're conscious, superimposed between the two, both top and bottom at, at once. And when I was reading about all of this, uh, Penrose at one point made an offhand comment. He said, well, this is for the sake of argument. We don't actually know, you know, if there's more than one free electron in, in there. We don't have, you know, the, the sensing capabilities to, uh, to monitor this. I thought, well, what if there were more than one? And I started working out a model. And the model I worked out is this. This is the central conceit. A bit of a spoiler warning, but it's the central <laughs> conceit of the novel, is that in fact there are in each tubulin dimer in the hydrophobic pocket, in each one, there are three free electrons. And uh, they can either have one of them can be superimposed and two classical, two superimposed and one classical, or all three in superposition. And there's a fourth state where none are in superposition. If none are in superposition, then as Hameroff, the anesthesiologist who collaborates with the physicist, Penrose, would say, you're out cold. That's what unconsciousness or zero consciousness, no consciousness is. No superposition, okay. That's the ground state, Q0, let's call it. The first quantum state, one in superposition, is basic functioning, and I make it functionally equivalent to Chalmers's philosopher zombies. A PZ, as I'm a Canadian, so I can call it that, a PZ, they can't do that in the States, because then it's a PZ, it sounds like easy peasy, it sounds silly. A PZ, philosopher zombie, has one superimposed electron. Bare mental functioning. The lights are on, as to use Chalmers' metaphor, but nobody is home. If two of the three electrons are in superposition, then you have self-awareness. You actually have an inner life. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. You can convince yourself of that. But it is literally self-obsessed consciousness, thinking only about yourself. Uh, and we have, uh, 
routine term for that. We call people uh, who are utterly lacking in empathy or any concern for anybody else, indeed who may in fact deny that anybody else is a real person, the most solipsistic of philosophies, uh, is psychopathy, the condition of being a psychopath. My third state, with all three in superposition, has that basic level of awareness and then a reflecting back on it, a, uh, a meta cognition, if you will, and that we also have a common name for that, and that is not consciousness, or not just consciousness, but conscience on top of consciousness, an inner voice, a literal dialogue with yourself. Well, you know, I could throttle uh, the interviewer right now, Nikolai, and go, oh, Socrates, <laughs> right? You know, he died, right? He was killed by people that he asked a lot of questions of. Why don't I kill you right now? <laughs> well, because the camera is rolling and maybe I'll get in trouble. It's a conscience that actually is going on. So I know, as just like the cogito ergo sum, I can get to that Q2 level. I know because I'm questioning what I should be doing that I'm at that Q3 level. But are you? Is uh, the man operating the camera over here? Is anybody else? Just like the Kagito, you can only assert that about yourself. So too, you can only assert clearly about yourself that you have a conscience, a moral governor, an inner voice arguing with you to uh, constrain your basis instincts. And I, the, the final bit of the conceit of the novel is that each of these cohorts is successively smaller. Vanishingly few people in the ground state of no uh, superposition whatsoever. The handful of people at any given moment who are uh, in persistent vegetative states uh, or who are been, been put under for surgery. Other, everybody else who is alive has that Q1 level. A smaller cohort, half the size, has the Q2 level. A smaller cohort, half the size again, Q3. Roughly speaking, 7 billion people on the planet, that works very nicely. 4 billion who are just philosopher zombies. Half that, 2 billion who are psychopaths, who care only about themselves. And 1 billion, half that, who actually are, I call it uh, firing on all, all cylinders, or CWC, conscious with conscience. And I like the W, the letter W in the middle, because there is literally a W, there are two U's, your base consciousness and the inner voice that argues with it, the conscience. That's the central conceit. Yes, and it's, it's a fascinating uh, premise to sort of position your plot upon, uh, which I greatly enjoyed. But let me talk a little bit more about the science here, okay? Mm -hmm. Because you did open up your book with uh, David Chalmers' yeah. uh, quote that you said is, it may be a requirement of consciousness that it contains at least one crazy idea. Maybe a requirement of a theory of consciousness that it contains at least one crazy idea. Yes. You left out those words, yeah. Yes, but 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 is that a crazy idea or is that just plain crazy? Because let me share. <laughs> is Chalmers plain crazy? Is that the question here? No, no, the question is about Penrose and Hammeroff's yes. uh, right. theory. Uh, because I've, I've interviewed uh, pr uh, Professor... Well, Tedmark is the guy you're going to cite here who hates them, right? Doesn't hate them personally, obviously, but does not like their theory. Yeah, Max yeah. Tegmark disagrees absolutely totally, with, totally. with their theory, but, but also... Uh, you know, I've done maybe 190 interviews by now, including uh, Stuart Hamroff, and probably his most popular interview ever was uh, was done with me. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, the vast majority of neuroscientists, psychologists, computer scientists, singularitarians and transhumanists that I have talked to, including notable people such as Ray Kurzweil, who, by the way, on the 2045 conference in, in uh, New York City, uh, went out of character a little bit, because Ray is usually a very kind of quiet and subdued mm -hmm. person in my view. He, on the stage, looked straight at Dr. Hamroff, and in front of everybody just told him, we know this is wrong. Right, okay, yes. So the vast majority of people right. Totally well, disregard the theory as unscientific and even woo-woo kind of like... Yes, okay, let's, let's address all of that. At first, the woo-woo part, I like Stuart very much. Stuart and I are friends. I, I love him too. Great. Stuart, Stuart yes. is generous in his friendship, yes. including being friends with Deepak Chopra. 
Yes. And I actually am on a mailing list that Stuart and Deepak and a whole bunch of other people are on. I don't participate. I just read it. And I have to say, when Chopra isn't being in his uh, public persona of woo-woo guru of, uh, of consciousness, he knows more than you would think that he knows, and he's more thoughtful than he comes across in that public persona. But that said, that association, to some degree, does tarnish the whole Penrose Hammeroff. Because what you want to say when you say Penrose Hammeroff, okay, maybe you haven't heard of Stuart Hammeroff if you don't study consciousness, but Roger Penrose is Sir Roger Penrose, collaborator with Stephen Hawking. That sounds good. Stuart Hammeroff, who is Dr. Stuart Hammeroff, collaborator with Deepak Chopra, in a serious discourse about singulatarian issues, about the science of consciousness, then you go, oh, wait a minute, I may not have heard of this guy Hammeroff, but come on, this Chopra guy is clearly, you know, <laughs> crazy idea in Chalmers' sense. So that's an unfortunate association. Uh, I admire the fact that, that Stuart uh, is, we call it broad church in his approach, because he does spend a lot of time talking to uh, people who claim to have experiential uh, abnormal consciousness experiences, which as an empiricist myself, we talked a little bit about the cogito, which is not science, because I can't replicate your cogito. There's no way I can say, ah, Nikolai thinks, therefore he is. I can't you do can't that experiment. You can't even verify it. You can only observe some outwardly science. That's right, exactly. And induce that maybe, maybe I have it. So that's where you get problem number one. Problem number two is I'm wearing red. My book has a red cover. It matches the cover of my previous book by pure coincidence of the art red director. Planet? Red Planet Blues. Red yeah. Planet Blues is about fossils on Mars, Martian paleontology, among many other things, but that's the conceit. And I remember talking to people in the uh, uh, this planetary sciences community a decade or two ago, and they all would say, if you got them privately, having a drink or whatever, of course, Mars probably had life. But they never say it publicly because the funding bodies, NASA, the federal government and so forth, had determined that that was a non-starter that you could talk about Martian geology, you could talk about what we might learn about uh, the future existence of our planet, but to talk about Martian biology, and uh, it's a little bit like the SETI community. You know, the SETI community gets a lot of press, and I'm great friends with um, uh, Seth Shostak. I named a Martian life form Shostakia in his honor in my <laughs> book. Uh, but as soon as you bring in those guys, there's also a, a bit of self-preservation in the academic community to say, let's just distance ourselves from that. So I think that's reason number two. Right now, quantum theories of consciousness, because they've been sort of oversold and tainted a little bit, and there's crazy woo-woo, I don't know if I can say bat guano insane, <laughs> uh, stuff like the body talk movement that uh, purports to be connected by the quantum web and I can do a healing touch on you without even being in the same country as you because it's all quantumly integrated. Come on, it's all crap, right? Obvious. So we distance ourselves intuitively from that. The third thing is Ray and a whole bunch of other people are deeply invested in the notion that artificial intelligence is a tractable problem that can be solved with conventional computing. Under the classical model. Under the classical model. And as soon as you have somebody come along and say, everything you thought you knew, you think intelligence is synaptic neural networks? So you think that's where consciousness or intelligence, yes, solve a chess problem, you know, okay, that can be done with neural networks. But the notion that you're going to uh, uh, figure out what causes inner life to give uh, a sentient existence to a machine that that also is just synaptic neural networks that it's classical computing then you got these these guys Penrose and Hammeroff and others who certainly uh, support their theory to one degree or another saying no 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 you're barking up the wrong tree of course I admire Ray greatly I also admire Stewart greatly of course Ray has to stand up and say as publicly and loudly as he can that's wrong because if it's right I'm wrong. <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's politics of science. What will turn out to be, who will turn out to be correct? We will know this decade. Uh, well, we'll know this century, excuse me. We may even know this decade. You know, when Stuart and, um, and Roger Penrose started talking about this, there was no good evidence of any room temperature 
superposition in biological systems. We now have in chlorophyll and other systems evidence that it actually does exist. So there's a, 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 an accumulating uh, body of evidence that their theory is not, to use Chalmers's word, quite as crazy as it might have seemed at the outset. But I fall back on what I said. My job is the most entertaining theory. It's way more entertaining to think that our brains are quantum mechanical than to think that they're just like a, a Texas instrument calculator. <laughs> and so I go with the, with the former when I'm writing my books. And it certainly does work in your book fantastically well. Uh, but let me ask you, because in, in our previous conversation, you told me that uh, science fiction is fiction about science, basically. Well, I may have quoted that. That's Hugo Gernsback who said that originally, the, the guy who coined the term science fiction. Right. So what's the balance in, in this or in your other books? Like, how much science do you put here and how much do you say, okay, I'm only allowed to have so many crazy ideas together well, with the science. Well, you know, I start with that Chalmers quote, and at the end of the book, you listen to the audio version, but in the print version, uh, there's a 52-book bibliography appended at the end. And the first thing I say is, as you read this or read the book, you may have noticed that I may have had more than one, re more than the one requisite crazy idea in the book. Um, but for me, first, I think it's important that there be a clear demarcation in the text. Uh, so that a serious reader can follow a log and say, okay, this is what we know, and then here is the hopefully reasonable extrapolation. So whenever anybody in my book cites something as having been discovered prior to 2016, the date the book was published, say, Penrose said this in 1995, that's true, Penrose said that in 1995. If I say that one of my fictional characters made a discovery, then it is a fictitious extrapolation from reasonable science. I don't think I have anything in the book that's magic, right? That, that I would abjure that as a science fiction writer. I would expect in my science fiction and in the science fiction of my colleagues, uh, obviously fans of consciousness are fans of uh, Greg Egan, for instance. I know you've interviewed my friend Greg Bear, Gregory Benford. Apparently my biggest mistake as an SF writer was not being named Greg. That seems to be the key <laughs> to success. But um, you're doing uh, quite well with Robert. Well, that's true. There, that, 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 that is me. Heinlein is a good predecessor in the, in the Bob department. Yes. Um, but uh, the, um, the consciousness theory uh, seems crazy. But when I, and when I extrapolate it forward, I make it clear where I've left off, even Hammeroff Hammer and Penrose, which is in peer review, which, you know, they're peer reviewed papers that they've done. So it's not like they're. Uh, dismissed entirely by the Academy. They have published repeatedly uh, peer-reviewed material on this topic. Uh, but yes, I try to make absolutely clear to people so they can make that distinction themselves uh, of what we really know and what my thoughtful, hopefully thoughtful, hopefully recent extrapolation of it is. But no matter what I write, Tegmark isn't going to like this book. <laughs> He may like the love story. Let's hope that he at least likes the fiction, the human part of it. You've written 24 books, so I'm sure he can find something to He'll like. He'll find something. I've got books about dinosaurs that, that uh, are not controversial in his area, but paleontologists will be right. arguing uh, about it. I've read the WWW trilogy yes. from you, and I also read uh, Mindscan. Yes. And I don't think that Mindscan actually was using the hammer of Penrose uh, theory of consciousness, or was it? It does. It does. Um, it's been a couple, maybe yeah, three or four um, years it's not since I Principal part of it, but in mind scan, not I, as much as here anyway. Oh no, absolutely. No, this is this is uh, my big um, exploration of it. You know, one looks at interesting scientific theories and maybe salts references to them throughout one's body of work, but you wait until there's the right book to dump what you know about a specific topic. Um, a science fiction reader has a great deal of patience for uh, exposition, for explanation within the text. But the mainstream reader, which you're also trying to bring in, doesn't unless it's germane to what's happening. Uh, as I always say, the most famous example is, you know, in um, uh, I think it's Magnum Force when Dirty Harry has the gun pointed at the punk. And he goes into a lecture about what the capacity of a 357 Magnum is. And it's the most powerful handgun in the world. Could blow your head clean off. He's giving a lecture. And everybody is intent on the edge of their seat in that 
that punk uh, is desperate to know uh, the answer, right? That is how you can do it. You can have as much exposition as you want when it's crucial that the characters know it. In this book, it was crucial for the plot that the characters know and understand Hammeroff, Penrose, Orc, O-R, and therefore there's a lot about it in the book. In MindScan, it wasn't crucial, and it's passing references. One of the very important concepts uh, also is the concept of consciousness, obviously, mm -hmm. here. So how do you personally define that? It is, this so is, of course, very it's tricky. very tricky, right? <laughs> um, you know, the thing about my friends, it, it, it's, it's a bit like SETI, right? Because we're going to find unusual chemistry as we move out into the solar system and eventually beyond. And people will say, well, that's life. That isn't life. Well, how do you define life? Is a virus alive? And you get into, are information patterns alive that have no organic substrate, right? So it's the same game that's played in a lot of areas where you have a, a science that's cutting edge, and even the experts don't agree about what would define an answer. Is this life? Is this not life? Have we actually pointed to the neural correlates of consciousness? Have we actually replicated consciousness on a silicon substrate? Well, as long as you can keep moving the goalposts about what consciousness is, you can always say, I've made progress. For me personally, it is simply that it goes right back to the cogito ergo sum, right? It is simply that self-awareness, that reality that you can inter um, interrogate yourself, ask yourself the questions. The W, the double U, exactly. Yes. For me, that's what it is. Um, but again, that almost puts it outside the purview of science. The only sense in which we can see it in you is if I ask you, so think about your own existence, and I see certain areas fire up in an fMRI. Maybe I'm seeing a correlate of consciousness. But that's even, that's the search, right? We're looking for the correlates. We're not actually looking for consciousness. We gave up, after Descartes, we gave up looking for the pineal gland or any specific spot where consciousness resides. We now accept that consciousness is a a meta phenomenon, maybe even an epiphenomenon within our brains, but not something that you can point to or easily carve out. And as soon as you say that, then it becomes very hard to uh, to define it. Right? It's almost, uh, you know, consciousness is where we apprehend qualia, the red of a rose, the red of my shirt, and and qualia are those things that you can't separate out. You can't take the red. And I can't hand you the red and say, here's my red, have a look at the red. You have to look at the shirt and the fabric and, the, and everything. Uh, so, and consciousness is like that. It is almost a meta uh, quale, the singular of qualia, uh, that can be, can't be removed and therefore can't be studied in isolation. And yet you find a very elegant way to resolve that from a scientific point of view as an objective way to verify it in your book. Uh, by the sort of quantum superpositioning of the electrons and sort of an, an independent way to verify yes. if someone is or is not actually CWC as you call them. Right. Conscious with conscious, conscious with conscious, conscious with, with conscious. It's hard to even say. Yes. Forget orc or R. I made my own <laughs> one that's impossible to say. But yes, see, now this is, you can argue that I'm uh, an empiricist at heart. Uh, some will dismiss me as a reductionist. But what I actually do think is that, despite what I just said, that consciousness is a material phenomenon of the, the, the regular universe. Uh, Stuart actually shades towards thinking consciousness is a fundamental force in the universe, like the weak and strong nuclear force. Um, and others the, think it's extra universal. It is a cosmic uh, uh, a thing that cannot be studied in the okay. laboratory. I'm not like that. I, I'm an atheist. I'm an empiricist, possibly even a reductionist. I think that whatever consciousness is, no matter how complex, and even just like any other quantum mechanical phenomenon, we don't say that uh, you know quantum mechanics can't be studied in the laboratory. Of course it can be. Companies like D-Wave in British Columbia are shipping working quantum computers right now. Of course we can study this and engineer it. So in my book, when you have consciousness, 
you're going to have some way for somebody to study it in the laboratory. And that's, ab when I say in my book, I mean in my philosophy of life. And literally in my book, Quantum Night, we have empirical ways to study this thing that so far we don't have any empirical ways to study. Yeah, I, I found that as an elegant solution to the problem. And it fits with your plot and, and your sort of foundation anyway. Uh, but let me bring in the 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 sort of it's kind of both been, a, I think, maybe a criticism in the past and also uh, a, a great feature for us Canadians that your books are usually both situated in Canada yes. and the main characters are often Canadian. So uh, what do you want to say about that? Why do you keep doing it? Why don't you go to like a more interesting place where <laughs> things are happening? Like, I don't know. There Santa's is no more interest. That is so Canadian what you just said. <laughs> there is no more interesting place on the planet. The central arguments in the American presidential election right now are over, here it is, my quote, over whether or not Canada is a unicorn, a mythical beast that many have heard of but can't possibly exist, a mythical beast where socialized medicine and generally socialist principles work effectively, a mythical beast where multiculturalism works without much conflict at all, where people actually get along despite their differences. A mythical beast where for a decade now, gay marriage has been legal coast to coast and lo and behold, the moral fabric of society hasn't crumbled into nothingness. A mythical beast that actually takes responsibility, more so now that we have a new government in Ottawa, for our role, which is infinitesimal in global warming, but recognizing that to just say, well, it's mostly the big economies that are responsible is a get out of jail free card. Not saying that, saying we have to take a role to, uh, in this. A mythical land where uh, atheism is not a, uh, um, a, you don't become a social outcast. You can actually run for public office and be elected by saying, I don't believe in God, uh, which you can't south of the border. So we are this, this wonderful 21st century, third millennial, culture, civilization, kaleidoscopic culture of all sorts of different uh, people bringing the best of where they came from or the best of the indigenous people who were here before us uh, into this gestalt that actually functions. To say someplace more interesting, name a place more interesting than that. San there isn't Francisco one. There, San Francisco. Is, <laughs> is San Francisco uh, is struggling? I mean, you look at uh, California only recently uh, had their referendum about uh, same-sex marriage, right, yes. for instance. Uh, San Francisco, my, my mother's from Berkeley. I know San Francisco very well. I spent a lot of time in the Bay Area. It's one city compared to a whole country. I mean, this novel is set in Saskatoon and Winnipeg. Calculating God is set in Toronto. I've set books in Vancouver. Uh, uh, Waterloo. Waterloo for Wake, Watch, and Wonder, where the world's pre, you know, it's, why don't you find a more interesting <laughs> theor uh, pure physics theoretical uh, think tank than the Perimeter Institute? You cannot. Yeah, One does not exist. I agree. So, uh, that said, I, I spotlight Canada because culturally, the world needs to know about it. It is the bridge of the enterprise writ large. Here, in 2016, instead of in uh, 2266, which is when we first got the Bridge of the Enterprise. Uh, it is astonishing to me, and I'm not a conspiracy-minded guy at all, but you look at the New York Times, and you can look at the front page for months on end and see no mention of Canada. The world's largest bilateral trading is between New York and, and Ontario, Canada. The world's largest bilateral trade is between those two jurisdictions and we are systematically suppressed from the media in the United States. Why? Because there are vested interests who want to keep down the notion that socialized medicine can work effectively, who want to keep down the notion that gun control can work effectively, who want very much as it seems in the upcoming election to keep down the notion that people from different ethnic, cultural, religious uh, backgrounds uh, and uh, the people who embrace gender fluidity can get and people who aren't gender fluid but are, 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 are cis and regularly uh, um, oriented uh, with their birth orientation can all get along just fine. There has to be, uh, you know, in this global village, the fact that Canada is systematically left out 
essentially of the search engine results of American culture <laughs> has to be deliberate. It has to be that the rhetoric of a Trump, uh, for instance, can't function if you can say, well, right next door, right next door is a case study, a proof that you are empirically wrong about everything you say. And therefore, it's absented from the debate because powerful vested interests want to be. There's no more interesting place, nor any more important place to share with the world than Canada. I, I would have agree with you to, to a great degree here because, I, and of course, I'm Canadian by choice, not yes. by birth. So that, that I think makes a big difference. But one of the disqualifiers actually in that uh, uh, election campaign right now is call one of your opponents Canadian. Ted and Cruz, and the Cuban he Canadian. Be disqualified. Uh, another another person running. I there. just have to say I'm following that with great interest because I'm a dual U.S. Canadian citizen by the same mechanism by which Cruz is. I was born in Canada to an American right. living in Canada. My same birth. as my wife. Right. So uh, I'm only hoping that he gets to run and and have the challenge. Uh, actually be settled by the Supreme Court, whether or not he's eligible to be President of the United States, because it paves my way to the White House <laughs> eventually. <laughs> no, not that I have any interest in that, really. But but yes, Ted Cruz, right? You got a uh, very interesting question. And so anti what Canada is all about. Yeah. We would very never for Texas, one second very say... Very much Texas point yes, of Yes, we would never say, Nikolai, you can't be Prime Minister of Canada because you weren't born here. That would be a reprehensible position for a, for any modern country to take. You're not native born, whatever that means. It's not defined in the US Constitution. Uh, you're not native born, therefore you're a lesser Canadian. As you said, you said it with a certain pride. You're almost a greater Canadian because it's Absolutely. not an accident that you're yeah. a Canadian. You looked around at the 140 plus members of the United Nations around the globe and said, I could go here, 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 and here, and this this set of values, this set of, despite the climate, I choose this place to live because of what it stands for. I mean, that uh, uh, makes you an uber Canadian. <laughs> and if you wanted to be prime minister, the idea that Canada would have Socrates as prime minister, I think is uh, very interesting. Uh, well, there is a new call, Socrates for prime minister. There it is, that's right. I that's haven't right. had that on my show <laughs> The <before>. hemlock party. <laughs> okay, well, hopefully the hemlock See, party See, we, we hardly be... ever assassinate our political leaders, right? So you're bringing a very American approach to it here. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I never expected we'll take such a turn. <laughs> but but so in, in, in your own view then, Bernie Sanders will be probably Canadianizing in a way yes. oh, absolutely. the American political absolutely. spectrum. Yes, and uh, you know, it's, it's so fascinating because uh, I took me a, uh, it's a year after I finished my book before it's in bookstores. So when I was writing my book, Bernie Sanders, who had heard of Bernie Sanders? Everybody thought when I was writing my book that Jeb Bush was the presumptive Republican Absolutely, nominee yeah. and that Hillary Clinton would was be unchallenged yeah. and that it seemed fairly clear that in that fight between the two great American uh, extant political dynasties, the Clintons and the Bushes, that the Clinton was going to win and that it was all a done deal a year ago. Now wild cards have come into it, which are a great example of uh, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And we have a Bernie Sanders as potentially the next president, a socialist, a Jewish socialist, an old man socialist, <laughs> uh, which is wonderful. And uh, we have on the other side, Donald this, Trump. this Donald Trump, who is a character that when I was writing my novel, I have a fictional US president, Quentin Carraway. Uh, who, as I wrote him, every time I wrote him doing something nefarious, I thought, am I going too far? Like they, invading Canada. Well, he does subsequently, every... right? Uh, you know, he says, uh, he's a Hitler-like figure. And um, I mentioned in the book, Godwin's Law, which is always invoked in an argument. Now, the, Godwin's Law really just says, if any argument goes on long enough, somebody will inevitably make a comparison to Hitler and the Nazis. That's just an observation. But the corollary, or as the Americans would say, the corollary to it uh, is the argument's done. If I say, you Nazi, you're just being like Hitler. You say, okay, now you've gone too far, we're done. We can't have a civil discourse anymore. The reality is that Hitler was not a one-off. He's not sui generis, one of a kind. There were 
leaders like him beforehand. And we and since. And, and but this is the point. And since. As soon as we say to ourselves, that was a one that was a crazy outlier. It could never happen again. You might as well be talking about miracles, right? They don't happen. They're, you know, uh, a, a horrific miracle in that case, but something that's so outside statistical probability that we have to give it a a, a name that exempts it from normal rational discourse, miracle being that name. Uh, Hitler is Hitler's playbook is the same playbook that Donald Trump is using. Find outsiders within your own midst that you can demonize. Uh, start demonizing your neighboring countries and saying that the only way we can deal with them is either cut them off or take them over, right? You either have the Borg solution, which is everybody gets assimilated, very American approach, not a Canadian approach at all, right? Uh, and uh, Trump, uh, when I was making my analogy uh, with my character, Quentin Carraway, or with the real Donald Trump, Hitler, one of his first moves was the Anschluss, was yes. the annexing of Austria. Uh, Austria. Yeah. And uh, this is my parallel to that. And the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia? Yes, exactly. That's right. Yeah. That's right. The, um, uh, and and uh, the thing about the Anschluss, it sounds, you know, one of the reasons was, A, Hitler was born in Austria, and the source, just like Ted Cruz, <laughs> said exactly the parallel. You could wow. see Cruz saying, let's solve this once and for all, whether or not I'm American. Now, everything north of Mexico is America. Simple as that. But also what, what uh, Hitler wanted to do with Anschluss was unify all the German-speaking people under one flag, right? Well, as we've demonized the Mexicans, as, as Trump has demonized the Mexicans, rapists, and he utterly, killers, and rapists criminals. and killers and criminals, and utterly ignores the fact, of course, that there are six to eight million, six million, an interesting number in this context, French Canadians. Uh, he looks north of the border and sees an English-speaking country and sees it as an impediment in terms of our environmental laws and the pipelines that American interests want. Uh, I could very easily see, for all the same reasons, whether it's Cruz or whether it's Trump, an Anschluss, an, an annexation of Canada, would make sense to that kind of rapacious far-right It's far been right tried agenda. before, so it's not historically crazy. I mean, in, in the War of 1812. That's right. Right. Which we won, right? <laughs> they don't teach that in the American textbooks. But we, meaning, because there was no Canada in 1812. The we Empire. We were here until 1867. The British but the British Empire yes. uh, did repel the invaders. So look up why the White House is colored white. It wasn't originally, right? It was burnt during that war. Uh, so, um, yeah. Uh, it, there has been, there was a manifest destiny. Americans have great phrases. Manifest destiny. American exceptionalism. City on the hill. That's right, yes. But Manifest Destiny was 54-40, right, which is where they wanted yeah. the 49th parallel of latitude is now the border for most of Canada and the United States. We're down 44 here in Toronto because we stick down. But most of it's 49. <laughs> they wanted 54. If you took 54, you would take almost all of the 35 million Canadians with you because almost all of us live within 150 kilometers of the U.S. border. We go as far south as we can for the benefit of the climate without becoming Americans, right? And that's right. that's where we go. And right. so we've settled down gravitationally to that 49th. They wanted 54. They would take Toronto. They would take uh, Vancouver. They would take the major cities if they right. if they had succeeded at that. Canada would be mostly just virtually unpopulated. Northwest tundra. territories. And Northwest Yukon. territories. Yeah, exactly. Great places. I loved Canada's north, but not in any way, shape, or form a, a world power. Right. Let me bring back our conversation to science fiction mm -hmm. here with, with this kind of idea. So in a way, uh, your novel is scarily full of foresight in describing very accurately like all the political debate and discourse and, and events we can observe right now mm -hmm. during the American presidential election. So that, on the one hand, is very impressive. So I don't know how long ago you wrote that, but it's like almost dead on. But on the, on the other hand, the even more important feature is that it's not merely descriptive. I think you have a subtext there, and you kind of brought mm -hmm. it more clear a couple of minutes ago, that it's also prescriptive. And there is some kind of ethical judgment going on. Yes. Tell me a little bit more sure. about that. Well, you know, Ray Bradbury wrote one of the most famous science fiction novels, Celsius 233, or as the Americans call it, 
Fahrenheit 451. <laughs> yeah. Bradbury said, my job is not to predict the future. It's to prevent the future. If I can show you a bad version of what tomorrow might be like, hopefully it's a wake-up call. And you say, oh my God, that's where we're headed? Well, I better, me and, and as my political activism, the people around me, we have to stand up and make sure we don't continue. We make like a, 1984. Like 1984, another example, a course correction. So... To me, it was very clear, and the book was the text of the book was locked a year ago, um, and uh, most of the book was written as much as three years ago. Uh, now, four years ago, actually, wow. started the book four years ago, finished it a year ago, it took three years writing it. But the seeds were all there that the United States, uh, and I, I don't mean to demonize the United States here, because we also had an awful lot of horrific stuff in Canada, which I refer to in this book. For instance, in fact, I make a point of not painting Canada, uh, you know, perfectly in the comparison to the United States. We have, uh, Winnipeg is, is the center of the, setting of the novel, most of it, for a couple of reasons. One is it is the geographic center of the North American continent. It is actually what we're all swirling around. Two, Maclean's, our national news magazine, Canadian equivalent of Time magazine, named it the most racist city in Canada. Ironically, for Americans, they would say, oh, it means black guys get a bad shake there. No, it's our indigenous people yes, who get a bad shake there. Who And so the novel brings right to the fore one of our great Canadian national disgraces, the, the national tragedy of missing and murdered indigenous or Aboriginal uh, women and girls. Uh, and the fact that our previous government said, well, that's not really very high on our radar. Very typical of uh, Stephen Harper, Stephen Harper, our previous conservative prime minister, uh, very typical for a party in power to see uh, the underdog being trodden down even worse and say, well, it's not really our, you know, we're worried about the big picture. Right. And actually liking to foment hatred and racism and and uh, the divisiveness of saying, well, you know, what we should say is there's a national tragedy of missing and murdered women in this country. End of discussion. We add in indigenous, oh, well, then it's their problem. It's probably just indigenous men doing it. To, no, it's probably, or maybe, we don't know. We don't have that data. Uh, but it's easy to assume. Well, it's indigenous men doing things to indigenous women. We put them on reserves, reservations, as they call them in the States. Out of sight, out of mind, not our problem, which is what our Prime Minister Stephen Harper said. So. I wanted to make absolutely clear that I'm putting the spotlight everywhere, not just on the United yes. States. But but that's the ethics sneaking in. It's very much. In the guise of science fiction. That's right, exactly. Because it seems so clear to me that uh, there are so many people who turn a blind eye, who lack any consciousness about issues that should be central to all of our consciousness here in Canada, in the United States, elsewhere in the world and that we are sliding back towards the circumstances that did give rise to World War II. Uh, you know, the easy answer to say about World War II is the German people felt that they were unfairly sanctioned after World War I. The, the Versailles Peace Treaty. The, the Versailles Peace Treaty was excessive, and therefore we have every right to assert ourselves again on the world stage. We, okay, we, we, we lost the war, yeah, 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 but slap us on the wrist, don't destroy us as a people. We're a proud culture, we have every right, right? That so easily morphs into we're gonna take over the world and kill those who don't think the same way we do. The seeds of that are so clearly there in the rhetoric going on in the United States, starting with the Tea Party. Uh, the, you know, the Tea Party is named for throwing things overboard in Boston, the Boston Tea Party. And ripples go outward forever when you have something hit the surface like that. And that's what we have, the Tea Party and its antecedents. And absolutely, I think, if science fiction, I, I don't write science fiction for escapism. I, you look around my house here and you will have a hard time finding any Star Wars memorabilia. A lot of Star Trek memorabilia. It's a little Enterprise there next to Homo Erectus, right behind you there. I Big Enterprise over there. I did find one little piece of Star Wars. There's over a little there. bit here and there. I, I yes. kind of like the droids, and I like Admiral yes. Akbar. I have two Admiral Akbar. It's a trap. I like that guy. But because uh, Star Wars, it's a trap. You think you understand science fiction, and you've been trapped into actually understanding fantasy. Science fiction is always about social commentary. H.G. Wells was all about social commentary. 
uh, in the disguise of talking about uh, abortion invasion, he's talking about British colonialism and imperialism. Yes. Time Machine, he's talking about the British class structure. Mary Shelley, the creator of this genre that I practiced almost 200 years ago, science fiction, with Frankenstein talking about the ethics of new reproductive technologies, talking about the marginalization of women in society, talking about how awful things will be if men take from women the one power they have, which is the creation of life. Uh, very much social commentary in the guise of cutting edge science stories. That's what I do. It's a long tradition. I didn't invent it, but I like to think that I'm one of the minority of science fiction writers who remember where we came from and and recognize it as a as a voice for social change. And I think, to be honest, it's a lot more explicit with you. Uh, and it comes clear both uh, in your interviews, for example, in your previous interview with, with me, you said something like, it's the intellectual stuff that interests me the most. Uh, science fiction is the WikiLeaks of science uh, or uh, uh, things like that. But also it comes through through your work mm -hmm. and, and you can see it there. It's a lot more clear and visible than, than other science fiction writers. And I think that's what makes you unique and why I appreciate it, because as someone who calls himself Socrates, I have a keen appreciation yes. and high uh, uh, interest in ethics and the importance thereof. That's why my blog is not about technology. Mm -hmm. My blog is about ethics. Technology is just the context because technology is amoral, but yes. what we do with it, how yes. we apply it, yes. makes it either moral or immoral. And that's why the ethics angle, to me personally, is so vitally important, which kind of explains why I love all your work, probably. But let me zoom out uh, a little bit here. And since you've mentioned the sort of science fiction tradition, um, can I ask you straight up kind of to get invited to the 2018 Biocentennial Party by any chance, if you have an opening there. Because you said you're going to be making a, a party in 2018. Oh, 2018, the Science Fiction Bicentennial. Um, I was trying to interest McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, which is where my archives are, the Robert J. Sawyer archives. Uh, they did a wonderful conference in 2014 called Science Fiction, the Interdisciplinary Genre in yeah, honor of the receipt of my archives. Wonderful event. And, I, and they said at the end of it, you know, we should do this again. And I said, well, what we should do is in 2018, on the 200th anniversary of the publication of Frankenstein, subtitled The Modern Prometheus uh, by Mary Shelley, uh, celebrate 200 years of science fiction. And I thought we were going to get some traction with Mac, and I don't think they're going to do it. And I was just out on my book tour for Quantum Night in Winnipeg, the University of Winnipeg very kindly gave me an honorary doctorate a couple of years ago. And I had dinner with one of the people who sponsored that honorary doctorate. It's, to me, it was a wonderful experience because it was uh, that doctorate, because it was sponsored jointly by the Dean of Science and the, by the time I got it, retired Dean of Theology uh, because of the uh, constant interplay of uh, science and spiritual issues. Calculating uh, God. Calculating God being one of those books that does that, but it's throughout my oeuvre. Uh, and uh, anyway, so I was talking to the man who was the Dean of Theology and is still a professor there, and, and we were both agreeing that Mac looks like they're dropping the ball. So we're going to try and do it at the University of Winnipeg. Hopefully we'll get traction. You need a little bit of money and you need some space and so forth. But to get academics from all over to come, as they did to the McMaster Conference, and say, look, for 200 years, this has been a valid form of social comment. And to finally put a nail in the coffin of the people who say, oh, maybe science fiction is starting to get some respect. We've been around longer than Canada. We've been around longer by, by four times than the space program has been around. We've been around longer than most of the things that people consider to be the core institutions of Western society. Uh, and it's time that we absolutely stand up and say 200 years in, the bicentennial men and women, to riff on Asimov there, of science fiction, uh, we are the literature that got us to the future and is our guiding light to the positive future that awaits us if we adhere and pay attention to the lessons that science fiction can teach us. Mm -hmm. And and I mean, Winnipeg is a bit further drive than McMaster, but 
Uh, again, if you could get me on that I'll list, I'll get you on that list. I'd be very grateful. And uh, we're talking about Winnipeg. I just want to finish what I said. The most racist city in Canada, which they own. This is great. They're not proud of it. But when that determination was made, it was wonderful to see a city say, not be defensive, but to say, Yeah, the mayor oh. admitted it, actually. The mayor said, oh my God. Yes. Yeah, right. What can we do? The people. I was just interviewed on by a fairly conservative talk radio station uh, over there. Uh, and uh, there was, yeah. We had to own that and do things about that. And now, at the Forks in Winnipeg, uh, is the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, which is where we celebrate the progress that has been made, but also chronicle the horrific failings by Canada, by the United States, by uh, Great Britain, by Germany, by South Africa, in the past, all the mistakes we've made worldwide, uh, to be object lessons so that we can choose. It's right at the Forks, I love that. The Forks of the Red, and the Assiniboine rivers, branching paths into the future, choice to be made. The red, which metaphorically is, of course, blood, and the Assiniboine, which is uh, a, a good native indigenous name, uh, do we go down which path? And there's this museum at the, at the forks, at the crossroads saying, choose your future, choose wisely, make good choices. We can do that as a species. And uh, going back to your previous point that science fiction can be the guiding yes. positive light yes. that can sort of shine the path towards that better future that we're even, looking even for. Even when science fiction is dystopian, give Margaret Atwood her due, uh, The Handmaid's Tale, nobody wants that future. But because she outlined that future, um, hopefully... We can avoid it. We can avoid it. Now that said, it's about women losing all control over their reproductive freedoms and the marginalization of women in society. And to see those issues be so much in the forefront of current American politics, uh, what would it be, 30 years after Margaret wrote that novel, 32 years now, I guess, after it came out, it's horrifying for me as a science fiction writer. We would like to think that The Handmaid's Tale did what 1984 did for totalitarianism, or Fahrenheit 451 did for censorship, even though Bradbury sometimes says it isn't really about censorship, that's the way it was interpreted. And those books did have salutary effects, but we're still fighting a lot of tough battles on some of the issues that Margaret very correctly and very uh, with great talent and, and, and uh, beautiful prose brought to the fore in The Handmaid's Tale. Robert, I can speak to you here forever, but unfortunately, I know that you, you're a very busy man and you have lots of other interviews actually right after I, this one. I have one. three more today, yes. Right, so let me uh, bring our conversation to a close with uh, two questions that I always ask at the end of my conversations. The first one is, what's the best place for people to follow and find more about you and your work? And the second one is, what's the parting message? that you want to sort of impart on me and my audience as we're leaving this conversation with you today? Sure, I'm a science fiction writer and I was the first science fiction writer in the world to have a website, so I got a great URL, sfwriter.com, sf as in science fiction. That said, you can also get to it by robertjsawyer.com if you prefer, sfwriter.com. On Twitter, I'm at Robert J. Sawyer, all run together, no punctuation. Facebook, Robert J. Sawyer. Um, those would be the best places. And if people want to, you know, contact me directly, just click on uh, email rob on, at sfwriter.com. I respond to, it may take me a little while, but I respond to all mail to, from everybody. Um, as for the message, the bottom line for me, why I love science, science comes from the Latin word scary or skio, I know, scary to know. Uh, Everything is knowable. We may not know it yet, but there's nothing inherently unknowable. I'm a huge Star Trek geek. Kiri Kinthaw's first law of metaphysics, which is a throwaway in Star Trek for the voyage home. Spock is being quizzed by computers on Vulcan to see whether his marbles are back in place after his uh, re, uh, refusion in Star Trek III. And he's asked uh, to identify, he's asked what is Kiri Kinthaw's first law of metaphysics, and it is nothing unreal exists. I take that to mean that everything is subject to rational investigation. There are no supernatural powers. There is nothing, despite this honorary doctorate from the, the, the theological 
uh, dean uh, and the science dean, theological. That's a weird to say. And despite quantum consciousness. And despite, but no, because of con see, I, I would not do quantum <laughs> consciousness if I did not think that within this century and possibly within this decade, we will know empirically whether or not it is true. A theory that makes no testable... Yeah, it's falsifiable. It's falsifiable. Yes. And, 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 and Stuart Hameroff is very good about enumerating Absolutely. the ways in which it is falsifiable. Uh, and, you know, it's easy, as you mentioned, for Ray, for Kurzweil, uh, to stand up and say, we all know what's wrong. Well, everybody stood up and said to Charles Darwin, we all know what's wrong. And Darwin said, no, here's the falsifiability. Find an extant structure in high-level biology that is not explicable by a series of gradual changes from simpler structures. You find that. That's what the whole intelligent design movement, which is yet to find a good one to point to. Uh, but they're at least they're taking up the challenge, right? They took up the challenge and said, okay, Darwin said, here's how it's falsifiable. Let's see if we can find it, right? Not want to give them any more credit than they're due, but that was the challenge. It's a falsifiable theory. So is um, Orc O-R. We gotta call it Stew Zombies or something like that from now on. <laughs> but they're not zombies. Gotta get a good sexy name for them. So for me, that's it. Nothing unreal exists. The rational mind and the scientific method is not only the best way to apprehend, to comprehend reality, it is the only way that actually works. Anything else is just self-delusion. Robert J. Sawyer. Thanks very much for having us today. Goodbye. Socrates, my pleasure. Thank you. If you guys enjoyed this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes, or you can simply make a donation.